You're going in the wrong direction. Number two, use your right guideline. Come on, number one, turn it around. You're headed in the wrong direction. Number one, you haven't got your guideline. Use your guideline. Turn around. Now that's better. That's much better. Now ride them two front risers. Let's pull them right down. Watch for an opening now. Keep your feet together. Keep your feet together in a nice roll. Yes, remember the instructions. Feet together and roll. Not always this perfect, perhaps, but keep trying. Although good landing technique is important, the main objective in jump training is practice in parachute maneuvers or how to steer the canopy. And for this training, a field marker becomes an important target for which jumpers must steer after leaving the airplane at an elevation of 1,500 feet. Only the essential rudiments of parachute jumping are explained to the new candidates during this short training session, and group instructions are given whenever it is possible in order to save time. However, individual attention is never overlooked when needed. Leaving the airplane and maintaining good body position, as seen in slow motion, is an essential phase of good jumping. It becomes routine procedure. Training starts here, after the chute opens. First, inspect the canopy. Is there a line over? Next, the wind drift. Estimate the direction and velocity. The preliminary canopy checks are important, so important that the jumper's ability to follow instructions is recorded, including his reactions to the coaching he has received from the instructor. The same system of instruction is followed on the timber jump, which simulates an actual fire jump. Here too, if the jumper lands in a tree, he can practice with a long let down rope, which will be used many times in a season of smoke jumping. The slip jump requires the use of important principles of parachute control. Slipping increases the rate of descent and is used only to avoid ground hazards in a high wind. Even on his first jump, the trainee may be required to make a quick decision to keep away from the other fellow in the air. Being alert is the important requisite. Learn to think fast and react automatically. Be quick to follow instructions from the loudspeaker. Forest fires do not often break out in ideal locations for parachute jumping. Usually, every new fire will present a brand new jumping problem. Varying wind drifts between the airplane and the ground may upset the spotter's previous calculations, especially when concerned with the small landing spots usually found in densely timbered areas. After all, when the pilot has completed his job and after the spotter has selected the landing spot, the rest of the trip to the fire is in the hands of the individual jumper. When he leaves the airplane, he is in every sense strictly on his own. The smoke jumper's parachute is maneuverable and the steering principles are not difficult to understand providing the trainee learns the purpose of the canopy steering slots, now seen when the chute is inflated. From a rear view, notice the normal counteracting action of the air flow through these openings. The air jetting through the slots stabilizes the canopy, holding it on an even keel in a normal descent. At the same time, the air escaping through the openings gives the jumper a forward speed of about four miles per hour, with slots always functioning from the rear. Of all these suspension lines, only two are directly connected with the steering slots and control their function. They are called guide lines. This outside line attached to the right front riser is the guide line controlling the right slot, while the outside line on the left front riser controls the left canopy slot. To illustrate, in making a right turn, the jumper pulls the right guide line, which inverts the lip of the right slot. This changes the course of the air flow, 
so that both slots are jetting air in the same direction, the force pushing the canopy around right or clockwise. Naturally, the jumper turns with the canopy, therefore changing the direction of his forward speed. The turning canopy stops immediately at any time when the jumper releases the guide line and the airflow resumes normal action. The left turn is accomplished in the same manner. A pull on the left guide line inverts the left slot. The airflow through both openings is now directional to the left, turning the canopy left or counterclockwise. A 360 degree turn is completed in six to eight seconds or fast enough for a complete turn near the ground. Canopy turns are used on every jump. New men cannot start too soon to practice on turns. Pull the guideline and feel the reaction from the canopy. The slots are installed for a purpose. Smoke jumpers will experience erratic wind conditions in this typical mountainous forested country. Strong directional winds may blow at the upper levels while calm air prevails in the sheltered valleys. The ideal condition, which some jumpers will experience a few times during a fire season, is an early morning jump in calm air to an alpine meadow surrounded by timber. The maneuver for this jump is shown by a zigzag pattern directly over the landing spot. It could also be a spiral jump, which is executed by holding down one guideline and controlling the turns directly over the target. In either case, the jumper should leave the airplane directly over the landing spot. Then maneuver back and forth or in a spiral to offset the forward speed of the canopy. He should turn and face the target on the final approach for an accurate landing. Most often, however, fire jumps are made under moderate wind conditions or in enough wind for landing areas to have a windward side and a downwind side, similar to conditions on a forest fire. Under such conditions, the point of takeoff from the airplane should offset the drift. Also, the jump pattern should confine all maneuvering to the windward side, all the way from the airplane to the landing spot. Just drifting along with the wind may result in a long hike back to the fire. For example, against a five mile wind, the takeoff point should offset a five mile drift. The jumper will maneuver a zigzag course on the windward side. While estimating the altitude and distance from the target at every turn. Until the last approach when he turns and faces the target coming in for a landing on the upwind side. A spotter will release the jumper even further into the wind to offset a 10 mile drift. After the canopy opens, the jumper should turn into the wind to use the canopy's forward speed against the drift. And if the drift is steady, he should face it all the way until it is time to turn towards the target for landing coming in on the windward side. Wind velocity may change quickly between the airplane takeoff point and the landing area. This may happen in spite of the fact that the spotter's drift chute successfully forecasts the drift about 85% of the time. Be alert against changing winds. Keep estimating the height and distance from the landing spot at all times. It's the best safeguard. Slip jumps are rarely used except an excessive wind when faster descent is needed to avoid a dangerous landing. Training for a slip begins at 2,000 feet or a safe height which will allow the trainee ample opportunity for practice. 
To start the maneuver, the jumper grasps three or four suspension lines and pulls them down hand over hand. He watches the canopy to be sure it revolves at the same rate of speed as he is turning. If it turns faster or slower, he should release the slip immediately. The canopy should be pulled down until the front perimeter is about eight feet above the jumper. The lines should not be wrapped around the arms or hands. They should hang free below and away from the body. Never hold a slip longer than 10 seconds. To release a slip, hold the lines in this manner, away from the body. Let the lines out slowly. Remember, they may foul around the legs or arms, so be careful. Never pull a slip jump under 500 feet. Pulling down the front risers is called planing. This maneuver increases the jumper's forward speed. With palms down, press the front risers downward until the suspension lines stretch and streamline the front perimeter of the canopy. The action spills the air out behind and gives the canopy a forward tilt. The maneuver is a common one and used often to stretch a glide to the landing spot. Never plane clear to the ground. A practice timber jump simulates an actual timber jump on a fire. On about 30% of all fire jumps, the canopies hang up in trees, from which they are later removed after the fires are out. Practice timber jumps give the new men experience in rope let down from trees. Here they also receive instructions in canopy retrieving. After the rope is securely attached and the jumper has released himself from the harness, he carefully works his way down using the branches without completely releasing the rope. Always use the rope for a letdown when the lower branches are more than 10 feet above the ground. The procedure adopted for retrieving the canopy is not difficult to follow. First, the letdown belt is removed from the jumper's backpack tray and used as a climber's belt. The end of a rope becomes a safety strap. And this hip pocket size pruning saw is essential for removing branches in tight quarters. Tree climbers are used whenever they are necessary. All jumpers will receive instructions in climbing, how to put tree climbers on and how to use them effectively. It is not as easy as it appears. The retriever should remember that he is wearing sharp spurs when working his way between the branches. Injuries need not happen, providing the climber is careful to avoid hazards such as rotten branches, hard knots, and loose bark. The letdown rope left by the jumper is also used for retrieving. By holding the rope taut, a helper can pull the canopy away from the branches as they are removed. Lines should never be cut unless absolutely necessary and damage to the canopy should be avoided. With canopy and lines extended, shake out all leaves, twigs, and other debris so the canopy is clean. Start the roll at the apex, leaving the apex out. And while folding the silk, keep it off the ground as much as possible. The lines are chained full length and later wrapped around the bundle. The apex goes into the sack last. It should be the first section of the canopy removed from the sack when it comes time for repacking. Retrieving is not difficult if this simple procedure is followed. Transportation is keeping pace with the present development of the smoke jumper project. Faster airplanes with greater load capacity are pressed into service to carry more men to the larger fires. Firefighting equipment for 22 jumpers is included in the one airplane load. Cargo can be dropped in larger quantity and with greater speed than heretofore. Using an intercommunication system, the spotter directs the pilot over the landing area from his position on the floor beside the open door. Spaced at one second intervals, up to six jumpers can leave the airplane on one run over the landing area without being scattered too widely. 
Usually, the descending jumpers must maneuver to small clearings, selected by the spotter as being most conveniently located near the fire. Here, the jumpers will establish a fire camp to which firefighting equipment and supplies will be dropped from the airplane. This is an important part of the training program. Here, new students have the opportunity to associate jumping with actual firefighting conditions. The basic rules for parachute jumping adopted by the Forest Service have been listed in this picture. The important factors essential to the safety of all jumpers have been reviewed briefly. There are many more. Actually, the jumper's training does not end here on the practice field. Each new fire jump will broaden the trainee's conception of safe parachute jumping. Every new jump will challenge his skill and his ability to work with others. Every jumper should realize that expert guidance must be limited on fire. He must rely on his own and have the know-how so urgently needed during the fire season. Practice the basic rules on the training field and on fire jumps. Leave the airplane in a vertical position. It's good insurance against severe opening shock. Inspect your canopy after it opens, safeguard you will respect. Face your landing spot, then estimate where the wind will take you. Plan your maneuvers on the windward side against a drift. And keep a safe distance from your fellow travelers while executing the turns. This picture has served an important need if by its showing it has explained the purpose of the canopy steering slots. After all, the ground coach and his loudspeaker will not be with you on fire jumps, so rely on your own ability to use the guidelines. to turn the canopy around against a wind drift or with a wind drift. To change the direction of your forward speed and to face the landing spot after leaving the airplane and before landing, fully utilize the minute and a half jumping time from the airplane to the ground. Learn to be your own judge. Don't wait to be told. Plane whenever it is necessary to increase forward speed. And always remember, your feet together and roll on landing. If you remember and follow the basic rules, you will arrive safely ready for the job ahead.